so thank you once again for joining for our discussion okay, thank you for inviting me so i was thinking today we could discuss on the topic of failure you know maybe broadly three things how, how is how has failure been viewed historically now how failure is viewed today and how it affects us how it has how it could be contributing to the mental health problems in the world and then what is the gita's vision of failure or the bhakti tradition's vision of failure okay is that okay so would you like to start with historical perspectives on failure all right so <clears throat> historically speaking anything terrible happening in your life meaning your uh, losing your wealth for a king to lose his kingdom somebody losing his fame someone unlucky in life unlucky in love so that's like a failure and according to the way we see history today so the greeks have a name for it they call start calling it tragedy and oedipus that uh, famous prince who loses his kingdom loses his family and ends up uh, killing his father so he's not knowing who his father is and taking his mother as his queen so that's like a really really uh, messed up life but it was uh, dramatized people would watch those uh, uh, people would come in throngs see those dramas and won't go back home and would not go back home thinking that what a loser so uh there was a very famous movie which came uh maybe about 10 or 15 years ago about the greek story of uh, 300 soldiers against a million strong or whatever the persian army and the spartans they put up a very yeah they put up a very strong fight all 300 of them were massacred and still that was not seen as a failure uh i would say that uh, we, we, i will talk about this later but while i was uh, jotting down some notes uh chatayu in the rama and it's a classic failure mm. he was not told that this is your job there was no one to tell him he just went beyond the call of duty he just saw that ravana is carrying off sita sita is saying save me save me he went and fought against ravana and surely as a servant of god as a soldier of god he fought uh, against ravana ravana cut off his wings and finally he actually killed him taking the name of ram on his lips he laid there and seeing sita not there in the ashram lakshman and ram start for searching her and then ram is mad with uh, emotion he is asking the trees the creepers uh, the valleys uh, animals and then he sees jata you lying in a pool of blood which i personally feel is the high point of the tragedy ram actually accuses him of eating sita or doing some harm to her and he says that i mean we can withstand anything but my worshipable lord has uh, not understood what exactly i did so this was all to accentuate the rasa point here that lord ram then uh, understood what that i did and then he left his body with his head in the lap of ram and lord ram performed his funeral rites so this certainly is not seen as a failure because uh, jatayu is glorious as a uh, faithful servant of of uh, of god 
moving further uh, in the world uh, history, we have the Romans who bent upon all the ro all the roads lead to Rome. That was the way in which they described their empire. And for them, money, fame, and military glory, that was success. And anything opposite to that is failure. Mm -hmm. So roughly, the idea that you need to have money, you need to have some fame, you need to have military glory, that's uh, uh, the idea of the military model of success. And again, uh, I would like you to later put some light on. Uh, I, I made some points about failure for a Kshatriya and the classic case is Abhimanyu. And we see how he was tutored to enter the chakra viewer. And somehow while the codes were given as to how to exit the chakra viewer, his mother fell asleep and he couldn't. Uh, so, so normally the reader of Mahaparth feels that, oh, what a tragedy. If only his mom would have been alert and he could have heard the whole thing. But then five Kshatriyas from the opposite camp, they conspired to kill him. <clears throat> so that is something about it. Kshatriya experiencing failure. Hmm. Among the Abrahamic traditions, it is Jesus Christ who in this sermon on his mount said, and that was not, the Western world was not exposed to any such kind of an understanding that, let's say that the me. Yeah, sure, I'll sure. Just, uh, reflect a few thoughts which I had before we move forward. Okay. Because a, a lot of concepts here. So okay. basically, if we contrast right now, these two, you give two examples from the Indian tradition of Jatayu and Abhimanyu. Yeah. And then there was Oedipus. So if we consider failure, uh, failure broadly can be caused by three things. This we can associate with the three terms in our tradition, Adhyatmic, Adhibhautik and Adhidaivik. That okay. means sometimes nature itself causes failure. Nature, say for example, right now, uh, people may have worked years and decades to build their businesses, especially if you're a small business, and then a virus comes and just disrupts the whole economy. So this is almost, you cannot very easily identify one particular cause for that failure. Of course, some people may hold China responsible and investigations may have to be done for that. But if you take it broadly as nature causing it, just the way things work out, you are playing a cricket match and you're about to win, but rains come and the match gets cancelled, abandoned. So one is the failure that is caused by nature. Then the second is failure that is caused by others' incompetence or malevolence. So we count on them and they don't help us or we count on them and they betray us. That, that could be called as Adhi Bhautik. What would be a Sanskrit word for failure per se? Apyash? Apayash. Apyash is Labha, Labhau, Jaya, Ajayau. Hani, Hani is failure. Hani is loss, isn't it? So, so that, yeah. that's how these are synonyms. Yeah, yeah similar. Hani, Apayash. Yes. So, Glani is more of decrease or diminution. Hani is yeah. destruction or loss. Okay. So now if we consider, so as what well, we could call it Adi Bhautik, Adi Bhautik, Hani or Adi Bhautik, uh, Apyash, but whatever. So when some other person is causing it, then it becomes more tangible. Okay, this person is responsible. And then maybe people want to take revenge or whatever. And a third is when we ourselves cause our failure. When our carelessness, our incompetence, our irresponsibility, our inabilities, for example, cause our failure. So broadly, if we consider the story of Oedipus, uh, at one level, it was his actions. He killed his father. It was he cohabited with his mother. But so you could say that he is responsible. But then if you go into the whole story, he did not know it was his father. He did not know it was his mother. So overall, at one level, failure can have different causes. 
and depending on where the cause comes from different people may find it uh, less or more acceptable that means okay you know if say if we consider sports because that's where it's like a microcosm of life today an intensified amplified microcosm so if at a winning juncture juncture rains come you might uh, players might rant at the rain the fans might rant at the rain but what can you do you accept it but on the other hand if there is a batsman who is batting very well and some other player from the other team while he is running across deliberately bumps into him and injures him and then that that batsman has to be carried away and then they can't win you can imagine how much hate might be poured on that player or if some batsman is batting and he plays a rash shot and gets out and then that causes the loss so if what is happening here there could be different causes and some some people might just beat themselves up you know why did i do that why did i do that why did i do that and they might never recover from it so of course it will be very difficult to separate that one cause alone is the cause usually all fact three factors may come together but depending on where we pinpoint failure individually or collectively so if a, for example a cricket player thinks oh because because of my mistake i lost the match and that person might become so depressed and so uh, so damaged psychologically they may never be get the confidence to play again or sometimes if a player is player causes a match to be lost then that player might get demonized in the public imagination and then no matter how well the player performs that's that that he lost that match for our country that becomes enshrined in the public imagination do you so, know that one colombian player he caused a self goal in the world cup oh okay qualifying match not a semi final or a final match hmm. but he caused a self goal the team came back he was in a pub and he was shot dead soccer yeah world cup shot football. dead huh? oh that yes. I mean, in India, we say cricket is the religion, but I don't think any player has experienced <laughs> physical violence. We have had people being garlanded with shoes or their effigies being burnt, and maybe security has been called to protect their homes or whatever. But I don't think any violence has been done, isn't it? Do you have any experience uh, or example of? Uh, you said that very nicely put. Failure can be natural causes. That means, uh, adi daivik. and failure could be adhyatmik my own body my own performance but for adhi bhautik other people you you have any ex- examples for that well sometimes it can happen in uh, uh, in boxing or in say sometimes a player does something unfair but the referee doesn't notice it and because that player oh. does something unfair and the other person loses now the audience can see that this player has done something unfair but the oh, referee but doesn't yeah. see it or for example you could say famously it happened in cricket that uh, i think there was australian captain you know he was clearly he nicked the ball and the ball he is ricky ponting he nicked the ball and well, the ball was caught by the wicket keeper but now it was a clear edge everybody knew it he knew it but he stood there poker faced and uh, at that time i think the decision review system was not there so the umpire declared not out so that became a ethical issue that should players be honest and if they are out and they know they are out should they walk out now he stayed he did not you know everybody knew he was out there was no way anybody could know it was very clear edge but somehow it is um, this is umpire's mistake but after that he went on and won the match i think it was against india only and okay. he was quite hated because of that so i wouldn't say the example of uh, an argentinian player and in a world cup match with england against england and uh, somehow many cameras are there but the cameras either fail to see it or whatever but his shoulder touched the ball and that's a foul in football mm-hmm. but the goal was allowed in favor of argentina and he later in the interview claimed that it was a hand of god 
it was wow. god who willed that we should win and he allowed me to do that so we will again take up this point later that very conveniently humans when there is success is at stake like you said the poker faced person he may not be poker faced generally in life but the opposite team may take it just like a game but he may look up to it as either name fame money glory or all of them put together mm. so the so to to uh, to just cover up my point of uh, other okay, thing responsible it is that's why i'm going back to this so i was saying that with oedipus it was oedipus it was more that okay it's nature and the greek view of life has been called as a tragic view of life that means a life can be a tragedy uh, in spite of our best efforts so when something bad happens that doesn't necessarily make you a bad person and that brings a certain level of uh, sobriety and maturity it can also lead to fatalism which we can discuss later but yeah. think that recognizing that uh, the person alone may not be responsible for the failure that is important and then if we move forward to the other example of uh, was it i think larvas or someone was a greek general there was a greek general in 9th century ad he lost a battle and he just he committed suicide it is not that he was captured he, he he lost the battle and could have survived but it was a disgrace said something similar to krishna saying maranaad atiruchya sambhavita sachakirtir maranaad atiruchya yeah. in 134 in the gita it says for those who have been honored dishonor is worse than death so the idea of course krishna is talking about there about if somebody is dishonored as being cowardly if you flee from battle yuddhe chapya palayanam is a characteristic of kshatriyas they never flee from war so in that sense i don't know whether failure in war was that dishonorable the more that fleeing from fleeing from war is more dishonorable than failing in war but either way the point is that uh, that if the whole responsibility for failure is pinned on one person's shoulders either by society or by that individual themselves then it may become unbearable completely and that can cause a, a person to break down emotionally or even end their lives yeah yeah i think those two cases of abhimanyu and jatayu we'll analyze when we come to a more spiritual perspective but right. this is something so you're talking about jesus i think no i'm talking of how uh, others being responsible not in a factual way but uh, in second world war adolf hitler found it convenient to blame a whole race on the failure of germany mm. and this also is a uh, like a inner demand or inner craving of a normal i'm not saying normal i actually mean a conditioned soul's part that somebody else has to be responsible for this failure escape mm, and uh, in our in our recent history like just 100 years ago we saw how a nation hell bent upon trying to find a particular cause for the failure found one demagogue just shouting from the roof that this one race is responsible and because they wanted it they all purchased this view hook line sinker as they say so so that is what comes to my mind when we see that so somebody else other human beings are responsible for my my nation's failure what it so we move ahead what else uh, do we want about a historical understanding of failure i think you are mentioning something about the abrahamic religions and jesus yeah so jesus was the one who gave a kind of a big jolt to the idea that you need to have uh, money fame and success in fact he said that poverty obscurity and weakness they are seen as good you will be rewarded in heaven for what you did here uh, they don't have some say they have but mostly people feel that scholars feel that there is no mention of a previous karma uh, a previous work reaction active now in your life and that's what makes you poor 
that's what makes you ugly that's what makes you uh, so called non successful or failure here but this is coming from a religious leader and uh, he's actually glorifying those who are poor so i like this sentence uh, the unsuccessful are more successful than the successful in the eyes of god yes i think they say that the first in the eyes of man will be the last in the eyes of god the yeah. last in the eyes of man will be the first in the eyes of god there is some parable also that there was a feast and everybody wanted to go and be first to be served in the feast they wanted to start first in the line first in the line first in the line and then some people went finally they they chose to be at the end and when the feast was served it was served to the last person first so yeah. the idea is that the meek and the humble should like shall inherit the kingdom of god now as far as karma not being present overall the new testament or for that matter even the old testament are not explicitly philosophical they are primarily uh, narrational and ethical to some extent the gospels have narratives through which some lessons are told and then the epistles of paul which form a major part of the new testament they are primarily his letters of instruction to various people across the uh, middle east and europe who had adopted christianity so overall philosoph christians have developed philosophy later by integrating uh, biblical morality with greek metaphysics but the bible itself doesn't have much philosophy yeah but this idea that the failed may be blessed that could be uh, that is a radical idea in many ways and uh, that gives a lot of hope to people who are facing failure now one thing that happened because of this uh, was also the religious justification of the stratification of society that if we consider the medieval medieval society in europe it was quite stratified there were the serfs and there were the aristocrats and serfs would not be normally envious of the aristocrats a butler could ha- practically never hope to become a earl or a duke or whatever or so would they would live happily more or less whatever you call as happiness serving in their way so the idea that one's present situation may be ordained by god and that this is the way living in this way gracefully dutifully can give us the blessing of god that to some extent man- maintain social order but then it can also perpetuate social uh, social injustice or social discrimination so i think it was napoleon who first napoleon bonaparte who first proposed the idea of a meritocracy instead of aristocracy he said that the people who are talented they be yeah. respected rather than those who are just privileged yeah correct yes and uh, interesting that he is often treated more like a villain against whom uh, all of europe gang together to curtail his ambitions but then the thought that he is inaugurated that has been more or less at least nominally adopted across the world democratic governments are said to be meritocracies so today the the at least the prevailing notion of how society should be organized is meritocracy somebody is talented somebody is qualified somebody is dedicated then they should get to whatever they want in life and while this creates a lot of opportunities and uh, hopes but the flip side of it could be that when we see society primarily as meritocracy that means among the three factors we talked earlier the individual social and natural adhy adhi atmik adhi bhautik and daivik it's almost in meritocracy uh, the your position in society is seen to be determined by you and you alone and while you can you can take credit for success but then you have to take blame for failure so failure is not seen as a event in a person's life failure it may be seen as a defining event in their life 
and not just a defining event in their life failure may be seen as the definition of that person itself like you said earlier that some people get called as losers so yeah. so no anybody can lose at any time in life but to label a person as a loser means it's almost like there's something wrong within them by which they will make choices by which they will keep losing again and again and that can cause significant psychological damage because the person might just become disheartened and depressed disempowered so this conception of failure as as entirely determined by one's own incompetence or one's own irresponsibility that could be a major cause of uh, of uh, of mental health uh, mental health problems in the world today basically there are two mental health problems according to psychologists that trouble people one is depression and the other is anxiety so we could say depression in terms of our analysis of failure depression is where we think that our past failures are what define us and whatever we do oh that this went wrong that went wrong that went wrong in my life and this will also go wrong that way the past failures keep playing on in our movie as a movie in our life and then they define us and they depress us on the other hand anxiety we could say is fear of future failure how oh, this i might lose this i might lose that i might lose that and again anxiety could be about whatever reason the failure might happen i might make a mess people might work against me or these things might go back go wrong by nature so fear of failure instead of seeing failure as as at one level almost a routine occurrence in life everybody will face failure instead of seeing failure as a life ending view that could be responsible for a lot of uh, mental health problems so we left out one historical view and that is the uh, the one given by gautama buddha and that is uh, stop desire stop desiring so that the twin evils of craving and lamentation you crave for something which you don't get and inevitably material life you lose things so you lament and this is caused by a seemingly unstoppable chain of action and reaction and if you stop desiring and aim for enlightenment you can cut these chains you can become enlightened and you can attain nirvana so although it was something around say 8 bc if i am not mistaken about uh, 1606 and 612 1200 years before shankaracharya where we come to the with him we shankaracharya will take the vedic view because he is the one credited with establishing the uh, supremacy or the bona fides of the vedic process so buddha's view point surprisingly has again made a comeback and is popular with guess who hollywood yeah so like a, it's a it's a religion in itself hollywood is a, like a uh, tirtha for movie making and all the gods and demigods they move around there so how come something which is totally devoted to the material understanding of success like what we have here that is said for jesus told poverty obscurity and weakness you aim for riches no matter what you want fame no matter what and you need to show people that you are strong no matter what so so this is something which is a uh, like a normal modern phenomenon here so in case uh, we are done with the historical understanding uh, if you have to add something otherwise we will take the, the vedic view of uh, failure yes just uh, interestingly about the resurgence of buddhism in the western world there are in my understanding 
three aspects. One is the ethical aspect. The second is the practical aspect and third is the metaphysical aspect. So the ethical means Buddha himself was not very philosophical in what he spoke. But there are many occasions when he, he dodged philosophical questions. And his focus was on just some, uh, you could say, observations about life, which can lead us to adopt practices that can help us face that face the adversities of life. So later on, there were thinkers who added metaphysics to his um, his teachings, and say, for example, the rejection, the categorical rejection of the soul, anattavad, as Buddhism is associated with, that is considered to be a later accretion. But in this context, in the metaphysical and the ethical aspects of Buddhism are not what are popular in the Western world. They are mostly the practical aspects. The practical aspects are maybe acceptance, letting go. If you, we consider mindfulness, which is historically associated with Buddhism, although the Bhagavad Gita can also be clearly said to teach mindfulness in many ways. But if we talk about mindfulness, it is remarkably non-philosophical and even non-ethical. Non-ethical means within mindfulness guidelines, people are not told, okay, that the certain dietary choices like eating meat is bad or certain sexual choices like, say, being licentious is bad. No. Ethically, you can be what you are. But practically, learn to let go, deep, breathe deeply, live in the present. So that, it is primarily that aspect that has been accepted. So Hollywood, I don't think, is ever considering being equipoised in happiness and gain, happiness and loss. Or like Buddha said, Asha hi parmam dukkham, nirasha parmam sukham. Desire is the cause of all suffering and uh, desirelessness is the cause of, uh, for the cause of joy. It's not those, now this, I'm, this kind of teachings, I'm, I'm saying these are not necessarily philosophical, they are more ethical. Ethical in the sense that it's a view of looking at what is the right and wrong way to look at life. So it's primarily the practical teachings which uh, of, of Buddhism that have been adopted. But Buddhism did bring in uh, the, a certain amount of resilience in the human psyche because, okay, existence is suffering. Uh, as they say in contemporary language, you know, SH star star happens. I mean, it happens. You know, why it happens, you don't know, but how do you move forward in life? Yeah. So, so that letting go, I think the let, uh, letting go, living in the uh, present, being mindful, these are things which are what are popular for facing life's ups and downs. All right. So my launch pad for a foray into the Vedic understanding is uh, I am kind of uh, taking a mirror image view of a verse by Queen Kunti. She says that Janma Ishwarya Shruta Shri Bhir that gives you that kind of a madness, mother. So bragging about your birth or your race or your rationality and uh, getting wealth at any cost, getting rich, and uh, education, um, just aim for the best education in the best institutes, among the best professors. Perhaps uh, you are aware that uh, six months ago, there was a big scandal where how some rich elite were caught bribing their way to some of the Ivy League institutions in America. So, yeah, uh, yeah so the lure of education and um, personal beauty. So even one white hair, one wrinkle on your face could mean utter failure for a Miss Universe the last 30 years or so, or a Hollywood beauty. And so if life today like birth, at least, we cannot change it. We cannot change our race, what we were born with. Why do we have the example of 
one of the most acclaimed musicians called the king of pop born in a particular race but did everything possible to change the color of his skin so that he could be accepted as as not of that particular race mm. so 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 basically um, if if we begin this with our, our launch card is the bhagavad gita this is from the bhagavatam but krishna is telling arjun that look what i am interested is in you understanding your constitutional position your duty your dharma in the pursuit of dharma you may win this battle and you have a chance of becoming a king and enjoying the kingdom here in case you are a failure you could be losing your material body as you see it now but you could be promoted to the heavens in your next birth now this is also seen as less noble strangely the acharyas do not treat this as one of the high points of the bhagavad gita that wow this is a good equation if i win i win if i lose i win who doesn't want this kind of thing hmm so any any thoughts on this so, like so how, are, how if i win i win if i lose i if i how? win the kingdom if i win the battle i win i can run the i can uh, rule here so i win if i lose my body some opponent actually strikes me dead i am promoted to the heavenly kingdoms and i enjoy a better quality sense gratification there so here i win i win here i lose i still win hmm. yeah sukhe hato va prapte si swargam jitwa va moksha se mahi so well maybe first i would like to talk about how within the vedic tradition also there are different levels of thought oh yeah and, let us do that first yeah, yeah and uh, the maybe the bhagavatam's uh, level of thought is probably the highest at least in terms of spiritual perspective of life so generally when we consider failure there is a frame of reference within which we see the failure say for yeah, example to what you didn't pass the exam but compared to what yes okay, compared 30, to what? 35% is passing so you got 30 that means you are a failure yeah correct yes so if you say a child is driving a learning to drive a cycle and the child falls that's a failure but that's a failure within the framework of say that day but if the child looks at it in the framework of say a month then within a month the child will start driving and the child will uh, child will start riding and riding expertly so if we expand the framework then we can see failure not as the enemy of success but as the entry to success that okay we always whatever we do we start by doing it imperfectly now it's by practice we might improve and we might succeed and it may be that by practice we may not improve so the entry is there it's not necessary that everybody will go through the entry and get to the destination but if we have a very short term vision of things we have placed things in a very small framework then even the smallest reversals setbacks can be seen as failures so in some ways what the wisdom texts do is is that they expand our framework so if arjuna is going to see from the pers- from the framework of this life alone then winning the war is success losing the war is failure losing his life or losing his property whatever it's all failure but if he expands his framework by understanding that life doesn't begin with birth or end with death it said that death 
in the materialistic world view is a period it's a full stop but within the spiritual world view death is basically like a comma yeah just this punctuation mark which changes the flow of thought slightly or significant end of the chapter not the book okay yeah that's a better way to put it end of the chapter not the book or we had earlier discussed about the world is a stage then we could say death is the end of one one act, act in the play yeah and a new uh, so it could, you could have a new se- stage for it or a new setting for it maybe you are in a new costume and you are speaking also newly so yes so if now if we expand the framework in which we are viewing then what seems as a failure that why wa- you died that can seen all be seen also as a success that oh you ascend to heavens and you gain a comfortable luxurious life in heaven so um, fa- our vision of success and failure are also shaped by our, the framework in which we are seeing and expanding the framework is is what is in one sense what the wisdom texts do so if we talk earlier about jesus also so we could say that is also an expansion of the framework that in the eyes of the most people think of failure and success in in the eyes of the world that's all there is to it isn't it that's what the material vision will see but a more expanded vision will see okay what about the eyes of god so in the eyes of god so the expansion of the framework can change our perception that's the point which i thought of adding in response to what you said yeah i think i think this is what uh, krishna uh, is basically through using arjuna as an instrument he is telling the student of the bhagavad gita that here we are not uh, you see none of the various astras and shastras and weapons are discussed in the bhagavad gita that could be puranic lore people could be interested in a wind weapon and when it is stopped by a mountain weapon or whatever the gita wants to tell us that first of all change your paradigm of uh, daily success and daily failure or even a yearly success yearly failure first of all focus on what is your duty what is your dharma mm-hmm. because because once you understand your dharma then failure and success can be easily measured otherwise like if you have to go to east but by mistake you take the uh, route to west and there you get a lift in a nice mercedes car so you say thank god i know that uh, the journey was arduous but here is a nice gentleman and he is giving me a lift and i can eat something i can drink something and i am also am comfortable and uh, what more to ask i am zooming i am speeding towards my destination but actually that could be this could be a once you realize that this is not the direction which i want to go then the farther you have gone you have to come back so it takes a lot of time effort energy to come back to point 0 and then take the right direction so as uh, we saw historically somebody losing his limb somebody losing a war somebody losing his name fame or money have they actually failed miserably in the short term yes but if they understand why it has happened to me uh, peter borwaj uh, one of my favorite motivational speakers and writers he said that in his interviewing dozens of uh, sports people who have actually excelled in sport the majority of them said that success didn't teach them much all their lessons have come from failures beautiful so if at all so generally plays, you know we wouldn't yeah. introspect <laughs> when we succeed we will exactly cel- we will celebrate yeah but it is when we fail we will probably introspect what did i do wrong yeah okay yeah so i would now like to move on to 
uh, I mean, this is one significant point. I thought uh, we have to discuss it. Arjuna raises the important question that, all right, my duty is a, uh, as a warrior, I'll perform my duty. I will perform with uh, enlightenment. What if, forget the material path, now I am a warrior who's a pilgrim of the spiritual path. What about spiritual failure? Mm. If I don't succeed on this path, I've already given up the allurement of the material path. And now I'm not successful in the spiritual path. Am I not like a ribbon cloud, which is just aimlessly taken away by air in any direction? Would you like to shed some yeah, light yeah. on that? That's an important point. So just cut, uh, integrating it with the idea of expansion of one's uh, framework. Yeah. Think that material success and material failures can be applied to a this worldly perspective. It can also be applied to an otherworldly perspective in the sense that we can also have you could say materialistic religiosity where somebody thinks that if I die, if I'm religious, then I'll go to heaven and I'll enjoy over there. So we are still thinking of our own material enjoyment. And so at least the perspective has expanded to the level of heavens, but then it can expand further and we look at not material pleasure and material material success, but we look at non-material success. So uh, as I said, spiritual success and spiritual failure. So now spiritual success essentially means connecting with spiritual reality, connecting with our own spiritual identity. By connecting means we develop a steady awareness. Our consciousness becomes steadily fixed on understanding our spiritual understand our identity and also it means connecting with the ultimate spiritual reality connecting with krishna so if we connect with krishna through whatever we are going through in life that is spiritual success and going through the going back to the earlier examples which you talked about the jatayu and abhimanyu Jatayu connected deeper with Ram through his failure. And so at a material level, it was a, it was a failure completely. But at a spiritual level, it was a glorious success. Because he left his body in the presence of Ram, remembering Ram, and he thereby attained Ram, Ram's eternal abode. So spiritual he success... Was a devotee, it is said he was a devotee in the Vatsalya Ras. The special mellow where oh, okay. you would like to be in a parent state while God comes as a child. So oh, okay. that could not have happened if you would have just met Ram and exchanged some pleasantries. So because of this, Lord Ram, understanding exactly what his mood was, reciprocated with him and performed the last rites just like a son would do for his father. So he was not at all the loser in the least. Mm, beautiful. I know that he performed the last rite, but that Jatayos and Vatsalaras is quite, it, it makes a lot of things fall in place. It's yeah. like a missing jigsaw puzzle piece. And so many other things fall in place that way. Beautiful. Yeah. So, so that was a success for him, although it was yeah. a failure. Same way we could say with Abhimanyu, although of course Abhimanyu did not directly die in the presence of Krishna. But he died for the cause of dharma, for the cause of Krishna. Ultimately, Krishna wanted that dharma to be established. So that was also success. So spiritual connection is considered the parameter of success or failure. And when Kunti says that, uh, that if we have wealth or beauty or high birth or Education. or learning personal beauty yeah, and learning yeah. Beauty, yeah. Uh, so then if we have all these these do not inspire us to call out to the Lord that means we become disconnected from the Lord so 
and of course she says i will accept adversity because adversity connects me with you deeper it helps me to absorb myself better you deeper so spiritual success means connecting with the lord and that perspective again if we have then even the greatest mental adversity could be a doorway to spiritual to uh, to spiritual success but now so this is just a few thoughts before i address your question of you know spiritual failure but you want to say something about this no, before no, we move this is this is good this okay. is good so then spiritual failure would mean that the spiritual connection with with the lord doesn't happen or we do not succeed in connecting with him so again when arjuna asks this question he is talking there have i have seen different commentaries which analyze his question in different ways so say we are on a spiritual journey we try to connect with krishna and we steadily practice bhakti so now the spiritual failure could mean broadly three things one is that our we run out of time and we haven't yet matured in our spiritual connection so that we do not get transported to the abode of the lord to the so we don't in that sense attain spiritual success by the end of this life so it's like you are in a school and you are about you are to get graduated over from there but then you are taken out of that school what happens after that so that's you don't complete your spiritual journey the second is that you voluntarily or because of the restlessness of the mind we give up the spiritual journey so one is time ends our spiritual journey the second is our free will ends our spiritual journey and in that case so within this there are two options now one is that we give up our spirituality and go back to a life of morality suppose somebody was living morally piously virtuously but not spiritually and they 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 renounce that life of morality within material society and focus on exclusive spirituality but they can't do that and then they come back to a life of morality and the third is that they not only give up spirituality but descend to immorality where they do something which is uh, which is which is we could say obnoxious or something shockingly wrong or what they gave up before coming here now they have gone back yes if they had come from a uh, immoral background or something like that so now in these three cases we could say that there could be different results so in the bhagavad gita itself krishna talks primarily about the first two options because arjuna came from a cultured background and for arjuna there is no question of descending to immorality arjuna was already very dharmic in fact we could say that when urvashi who was the most beautiful of the celestial damsels propositioned him he he said no so he had that level of will power to say no to temptation so if you look at those two options what arjuna says uh, maybe you would like to explain the first two options what krishna says and then i can talk about a third no 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 you go ahead you have this flow so i will add yeah. a few points I so i think so the first option krishna says is that if you are not completed that journey you will continue from there and you will already be born in a uh, in a cultured family in a, not just cultured family in a spiritually advanced family athava yoginam eva kule bhavati dhimatam etad durlabtaram loke janma didrusham so i like to take this example that if you are in a school and you are very close to graduating so then uh, if somehow your parents get uh, parents get transferred or whatever uh, then what happens you go to another school and you continue from there so if you are near gradu- graduation then you go on and graduate from there so in that like sense resume it's like a resume, resume down exactly down resume from so resume from where you are and krishna says that opportunity to be born in the in a spiritually minded family that is rare so 
that spiritual gain is not lost at all it is you just straight away resume from where you are now the second we could say say a student is in school in university and is on the path to graduation but say the student gets uh, infatuated sports and says that yeah i just want to maybe play professional football i play professional cricket and i don't want to study now in some cases the students uh, many of these universities especially in america i found that people choose universities based on what kind of sports are played over there <laughs> in india we choose based on merit of what kind of uh, job, job campus opportunities come afterward yeah. but sports is a big thing and there are universities which have sports scholarships that means you may not have any academic merit but if you are good at a particular sport and that university wants their sports team to be good we want our football team to be good we want our baseball team to be good and if you are a good player then you don't have to have you don't have to pay fees you don't have to have good grades but still you will come in and then sometimes if the students want to focus on their sports the university might even say that okay you focus on the sports and you don't have to study you don't have to give exams we will provide you the facility to play that sports and you excel in it so we could say that when krishna says if somebody now why would somebody go back to morality and give spirituality that is because they want material pleasures not material pleasures in terms of immoral or anti anti spiritual pleasures but just the good things of life they want to enjoy in a virtuous way like dharma leads to artha and kama so then krishna says if that's what you want you can have that abundantly and so such people who give up spirituality because they want to materially enjoy life in a moral way yeah then they will go to heavens so it's like uh, like a student who wants to not study but play a sports then the university might provide the best facilities for them to play the sports and excel in that so like that heavens are the place where one can have abundant material enjoyment and then one enjoys enjoys and then krishna says prapte punya krutan lokan ushitva shashvati samaha now it's interesting he uses was the shashvati earlier he says that atma is shashvata is eternal so for the per, for the person in this world heavenly life seems like eternal although it's not eternal it's very long okay you enjoy as much as you want and then eventually you'll get seated this is enough and then you are again born in a family where you don't have to worry too much about the material necessities of life kuchi naam shrimatam ye hai so either a cultured family or a, or a wealthy family by which the material aspect of life is taken care of you know i read that and it makes sense that for people to have a happy material life there are two things there are your relationships and your career so your finances and your uh, relationships we could say so shuchi naam and shrimatam we could relate that way if you are shrimatam you don't have financial worries if you are shuchi naam if you are born in a cultured family then if everybody is reasonably cultured people know how to deal with relationship issues they don't blow up and they don't make things worse so then you can continue from there so that that's the idea of how spiritual failure can all is is not in that sense failure ultimately it is it may be a temporary interruption or it it might be just a transition for a resumption or it might be a temporary interruption followed by a eventual resumption any thoughts on this so, yeah yeah so 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 this is how you nicely summarized uh, how do we see uh, success from the point of view of dharma and then what happens to an unsuccessful yogi as krishna says if he uh, even if he fails here in the next life he gets a higher birth a higher birth can be of two types in a family of uh, opulent people so the normal necessities don't become any kind of a headache or if he has practiced yoga for a very long time 
and then there is an interruption, then he is born in the family of practicing transcendentalism. Uh, my last point is, we discussed the uh, historical... Yeah. Before that, I'll just quickly sure. mention the third possibility, that if somebody falls to immorality, yeah. then what happens? So I think this Vishwanath Chakravarti talk, talk, talks about in his commentary to that verse... Uh, Abhichet? Not Abhichet to Duraja, that, which is the verse which says that uh, even the low-born people are chanting the names of the Lord. Aho, Aho Bata Shapachato. Uh, Aho Bata Shapachato Gariyan. Ya Jivagre Vartate Namatubhyam. So he explains over there that if they push the post, if all of them have done these virtuous activities, if, if somebody is chanting the holy names of the Lord and they are low-born, then he says we need to understand they already done these virtuous activities. So the question may come up if they already done the virtuous activities, why might they be low born at all? So one thing could be that they did the virtuous activities, but they did some, some sinful activity. So because of that, they were low born. Another is they were practicing bhakti. They were practicing transcendence, but they did some grievous material wrong. And that material wrong has its consequence in terms of the birth they got. But are you there? Or yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. They got that birth, but they did not. So they lost their material position, but they didn't lose their spiritual disposition. And that is what we also see in the story of Bharat Maharaj, because he got attached to a deer. In his next life, he became a deer. So he lost the material position of a human form of life and he degenerated. So a uh, low birth in a human species is not as bad as we could say a low birth in an animal species. So he mm. degenerated even further, but he did not lose his spiritual disposition. And that spiritual disposition inspired him to even as a deer, not just do normal activity like a deer, but associate with sages. And yeah. then he continued his spiritual life from there. And next life, he became Jada Bharat, who was completely focused on spiritual life. So these people who are low born and are chanting the names of the Lord, he says, they refer to they, they can be people who were spiritually minded, but they became, they did some grievous wrong because of which they are low born. So they, they lose a materially comfortable position, but they don't lose their spiritual disposition. So in that sense also, although there is a, there is a, we could say a serious material failure. Yeah. But still, the there is a spiritual connect, spiritual continuity still happening. The spirit, the, the, what is done spiritually is not lost. So you wanted to, you are saying something yeah. last point. So, so, so my last significant point is that uh, we took an overview of uh, failure as far as uh, some of the prominent world faiths have uh, focused upon them. And we also delved uh, deeply into the Vedic idea based on Gita and Bhagavat. Now the current reality is 2008, there was a shock in Wall Street where this term came to be used for the first time. The one percenters, the one percent of the elite who are controlling something like 75 to 80 percent of the world's wealth. Now, of course, this wealth is Kali Yuga wealth calculated just in terms of stocks, options, bonds, and that kind of intangible wealth. We are not talking of the Vedic wealth of uh, Gavayo Dhanuvan, Dhanyanam Dhanuvan. Somebody has cows, Godhan, somebody has grains, that is rich. No. There was a reaction from uh, certain sections of society, and which could be based in the uh, Judeo-Christian or Buddhistic or Vedic understanding that how come somebody can be so selfish and they are also not able to properly enjoy their so-called wealth. They also are highly anxious, stressed out, depressed people. So there was this a brief thing about which was called the Occupy Wall Street. Yes. That please do not describe success as Forbes. Forbes is a magazine in America and they call it the capitalist tool. Oh. They are so, yeah, they are open about it. This is what 
this is america you need to make more money more money will make you happy and possibly this message from america is also accepted worldwide when i was studying economics i was always told that india is a underdeveloped country mm. why underdeveloped because you don't have tar roads you don't have telephones you don't have so many cars for 10000 people you don't have so many lawyers now instead of a gross domestic product so some economists or sociologists have started suggesting the gross happiness product and success today for any economy means how many lawyers per 10000 population how many uh, tarred roads per 10 i mean your total uh, diameter uh, surface area of your country and how many uh, uh, tar roads you have how many mri machines how many cancer surgeries how many heart surgeries so when they started changing the questions to would you like to change your job would you like to change your partner would you like to change the place where you are staying do you have how many of friends you have 5 10 15 25 so when some of these questions were administered all almost all the developed countries they started coming at the bottom of the table and countries like bangladesh and bhutan which are called failures in one way they started coming up so this is the nature of this world there is a sanskrit subhashit which says ati sarvatra vivarjayet mm. but not to take everything in excess but material life as a uh, it's a natural it's a concomitant factor of materialism that you don't know where to stop so checks and balances are needed again the moment we start saying that it is better not to have wants it is better not to have uh, like the things which kunti says if you have beauty if you have wealth if you have education so somebody would say so what to do with that give it up if i am having money then squandering money is that uh, being enlightened no what i like in the bhagavad gita is understand the source if a person understand that the source of my poverty and the source of my wealth both these are beyond my control hmm. that means i i i did something therefore i am poverty stricken now and immediately i just do two three push the right buttons and i am rich again that's not going to happen hmm. if you have a spiritual direction in life then if you have the good so called good things you can use them in case you don't have them you are not a failure yes so this is a very good point but how did you connect this with occupy street and the changing definitions of happiness okay, occupy within occupy street is connected because although we have uh, the knowledge of the bhagavad gita the force of wall street the tremendous clout it has the way it has captured media this propaganda is something which is just like a uh, like a road the roller it is a stream rolling everything in its path mm. and and most of the you mentioned depression you mentioned some mental illnesses most of them are caused by like first of all this model is deeply ingrained that if you don't have money you're not successful you are a failure if your business fails you are a failure if you fail in relationships you are a failure so how do you buy relationships of course you have to have money mm. how do you become famous you can purchase fame just you have to have more money so as i say you may run around in so many circles but you come to the center point and that is financial success only Okay. So, so the second so, definition also when you're yeah. talking about how many MRIs are there or how many how much tar roads are there, that is also ultimately you're saying a 
uh, uh, material. How much money, money a country has? Okay, but it's not just so much in terms of the the currency, but in terms of the material resources that are available for people. Exactly, exactly. So those who are financially strong, they define what is success for themselves. It could be tolerated when they start de defining success for others. Then it becomes problematic. What do you mean define for others? Like say America and Europe, they have their own success models and they stick to that. When they start oh. telling Asia and Africa that not only you are miserable, but you have to be like us. Hmm. Yes, yes, yes. So, Bhuta, so according to if just the parameters of success were changed, then Bhutan and Bangladesh are already happy. Exactly. So why do they have to become like the West? So they are happy with their partners. They are happy with the job they have. They don't want to relocate to any other place in the country. They have their own neighborhood. They are happy with that. But this, today's uh, media, they will say, no, no, this is, this is bad for business. You know, this could also be earlier I mentioned about uh, the vertical mobility and uh, not uh, horizontal mobility. So yeah. if we see our present situation as in some way a divine arrangement, then accepting it becomes relatively easier. Yes. And so if one sees marriage, for example, uh, more as a duty or obligation rather than simply as an option, option or opportunity for pleasure, then, okay, if this is not giving me pleasure, let me just break it. But if I see this is a duty and let me continue it, there are always difficulties in relationships, let me persevere. So then that steadiness comes up. So uh, that is, when there is too much, uh, too much focus on, first of all, a material definition of success. And the second that the material definition of the material success will be attainable by your efforts alone. Then that leads to a lack of material stability. Oh, this is not working right. Let me change this. Let me change this. Let me change this. And then there is lack of commitment and that we see tremendously in relationships. And it's interesting that there is lack of commitment, not only in relationships, but there is lack of commitment even in jobs. Uh, in many, many, especially software industry, if somebody works in the same job for 10, 15, 20 years, people look at what's wrong with you. Then do you, do you want to grow? And the idea of growing is you won't grow in the same company. You change and you have better prospects. When I was 28, if somebody has changed six or seven jobs at age 28, the next interview, they would say, what's wrong with you? Today, if you say that I'm at the same job for the last 12 years, they will ask you, what's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, that's true. So steadiness. Uh, so would you like to summarize? Yeah, just uh, one point to conclude this. So I, I would like to say, you talked about God's role. And say now, if we, understand, if we have the spiritual definition of success as foremost, that through every situation in my life, through success and failure, I'm ultimately meant to connect with the Lord. And if that connection is deepening, then the failure or success doesn't matter that much. It matters, of course, but it doesn't matter that much. It doesn't have to be catastrophic. So I would, if in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, if you stay connected with me, I will give you intelligence. Tesham satatyuktanam bhajitam priti purvakam dadami buddhi yogam tam yenam amupayantite. If you seek to stay connected with me, then I will give you the intelligence by which you can make further choices by that to come closer to me. So I would like to make this point now that we talk that sometimes failure might be because of our own mistakes. It might be sometimes because of others' incompetence or malevolence, or it can be sometimes because of just nature. And at a practical level, each of these may need to be addressed appropriately. Sometimes I really need to become more responsible, learn some skills. Sometimes there might be some people who are toxic in my life and I might need to distance myself from them. It could be in relationships, it could be a boss or sometimes you know, certain environments may just, not, certain, may just not be suitable for particular things. Then I might have to change that. I may have to 
whatever it is i may have to change my situation if i if i am doing a particular say if somebody starts a hotel in an area where where people don't come to eat then in hotel industry there is a location 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 is extremely important so then it's not just you know you just have to change maybe the social the economic district changes and then you have to change so basically we may have to take an appropriate approach and we may at a practical level have to pinpoint okay this was the cause of the failure and this is what i need to do to change it but we won't fixate on that too much if our framework expanded will just as failure is a event in life so correcting for failure is also a choice in life Very neither good. of them has to be catastrophized so by focusing on the spiritual connection and on seeing spiritual connection as the primary definition of success it is not that we become uncaring about material success or failure i i like to differentiate between becoming uncaring and being uh, undisturbed so when krishna says tit dhir muni dukkheshu anudigna mana sukheshu vigata spruha we equipoised that doesn't mean don't care obviously arjuna krishna wanted arjuna to fight a war and krishna wanted arjuna to win the war so arjuna was not uncaring about what happened in the war whether the success or failure but he was not he by the spiritual knowledge given by krishna he could stay undisturbed he could stay fixed so we can learn from our failures and grow towards success by making the appropriate changes and choices if we have the stability coming from our spiritual connection yeah. and the bhagavad gita itself describes this model that krishna tells arjuna tasmat pramuttishtha yasho labhasva jitva shatrun bhungsha rajyam samruddham mayai vaite nihata purvameva nimitta matram bhava savesaji so krishna also assures arjuna that he will get material success but he says first become spiritually connected become my instrument so if you become an instrument for me you will get success also not necessarily always nobody will always get success because that is not the nature of the world but that is so if we focus on spiritual connection and we focus on making sure that our spiritual success is our first priority then we will do what it takes to get material success learn from material failures and we will uh, be able to do better even in the material aspects of our life so any thoughts on this before we summarize and conclude no no can come ji so i will summarize some things and if you have some things to add you can feel free to add okay. so basically we had a planned thought flow that first we look at various historical definitions of success and we look at the contemporary definition of success and how it affects us in terms of mental health and then we talk about the bhakti definition of success or the vedic definition of success so historically some the say the greeks sophocles and oedipus oedipus thought that life is tragic so even if we mess up in life we make terrible it's not that you are a bad person good people can have can sometimes circumstantially make bad choices and terrible things so terrible things can happen so acceptance of life's tragedies that was the focus then from the greeks to the romans there was a radical shift where the whole definition of success was material success and failure was considered to be a personal loss and that's why we have a roman generals on failing committing suicide and then we talked about the the christian conception that failure can be a state of blessedness so we may fall in the eyes of the world but we may rise in the in the eyes of god and then the modern conception comes significantly from the idea of meritocracy coming from napoleon that if you are good you will succeed uh, the problem with that idea is that failure becomes our own sole responsibility and that can burden us so depression is past failures playing on and on in our head and anxiety which is another major mental health problem is the fear of future failures paralyzing us so then we talk from the anything in the western or contemporary i left out this not western but the world but did you discuss the buddhist contribution oh yeah buddhist uh, so in the buddhist idea 
just become detached yeah. and then you can avoid both the trauma you can avoid both all kinds of emotional upheavals both the elation of success and the dejection of failure and what has popular what has been popularized in about buddhism is not the metaphysical or even the ethical it's more the practical ideas of letting go being present and being mindful and then we talk about the vedic concept so failure can happen because of our own mistakes adhyatmik because of other people's incompetence or malevolence that is adi bhautik and because of nature that's adi daivik and learning to appropriately analyze the cause of failure is essential for us to move forward so what wisdom texts like the bhagavad gita is to is do is expand our framework so death in a war field is a failure in this life but if we consider death as each each lifetime as just one chapter in a book then that failure takes one to heaven which is success at another level but this can also be we could say materialistic religion where the definition of success in heaven is also material enjoyment the gita expands it further to a spiritual definition of success wherein getting connected with krishna is the primary purpose of life and the primary and the overarching definer of success so through material adversity or through material prosperity if we are deepening our connection with krishna then we are successful and if we are connected with krishna then we can have the inner composure to make to process what caused the failure my mistakes other people i myself other people or nature and take appropriate actions and we discuss also about spiritual failures where somebody doesn't succeed in reaching krishna and there are three options if somebody just leaves because somebody just runs out of time that is like a student transferring before they graduate then they will just resume in another place and graduate if somebody leaves because they want material enjoyment pious religious material enjoyment and then they will go to heaven and come back that's like a student who is too caught up in sports and they suspend their education so that they can play sports but then they come back and resume again and third is when uh, somebody falls to immorality then they may lose the material position they may be low born so although they lose the material position they don't lose the spiritual disposition and they resume eventually so by staying spiritually connected we will always be on the path to spiritual success and we will be better situated to attain material success also because we will be able to process failure better learn from it better and move toward material success also anything left out no thank you nicely covered thank you this was a quite a stimulating discussion <laughs> look forward to more discussions in future hari krishna yes.